I am delighted to welcome all of you to the conference on uh, religion and equality and here at bar -Ilan University, the Faculty of Law at bar -Ilan University. And I'm happy that everyone was able to make it. Um, first, at the beginning, I want to, uh, uh, I want to uh, thank my colleagues to the uh, organizing com uh, committee, Professor Tzvi Zohar, who is not here yet, he'll come later, and Dr. Amos Israel, you help me, all of, all of them, in uh, ideas and efforts to make this uh, conference possible. And um, I want to thank Sylvie Lipsker, who is the uh, director of the, uh, our events department, and she is responsible for all the logistics. And I want to thank uh, Professor Shahar Lifshitz, our dean, for the encouragement and support in uh, making this conference possible. And, uh, Shahar, please start with uh, greeting and more than greetings. Thank you very much. So, first, welcome all, welcome all especially for our uh, visitors from abroad. Welcome to Israel. We're, welcome to Barilan Faculty of uh, Law. The Mishnah in Yevamot say, they say to him, the man that divorced is not like to the woman that is divorced. For women, is goes out with her consent or without it, but a husband can't send away his wife only his own consent. So the, uh, so the starting position of a Jewish divorce law is strictly unequal. In modern, in modern terms, the men are subjugated, the husbands are subjugated to unilateral no-fault divorce system, which means that every husband can end the relationship whenever he wants and for any reasons that he wants. The, the wife are subjugate to a strict fault consent system in which in order to get the divorce, they need either the consent of the husband or a, a, in a very rare circumstance to prove that the husband was in fault. So here is a, a, a classical example of an equal position of a religious law, in this case Jewish law, toward equality, in this, in this case gender equality. However, if we looking during the history, we can see that the starting point is not the end point. And during history, Jewish law try to uh, uh, itself feel that there is a problem in a situation in which it is so easy for husband to, uh, to get divorced, but not for the wives. And then, if the law tried to find a symmetry, it tried to do it in two different technical. One is to make divorce difficult, both for husband and for wives. The second is to make divorce easier, for, uh, uh, both for husband and for wife. And, wife. and, and as we can see, Jewish law indeed try the two options. On one hand, what we called the Rabenu Gershom decree, the famous Rabenu Gershom decree, which forbid husband to, uh, uh, to get divorced from his wife without her consent, go in the first direction and say, like the wife need the consent of the, the husband, so the husband will need the consent of the Wife. However, the, the Rabbeinu Gershom decree didn't really achieve equality. Why? For three reasons. One is that theoretically now there is equality because both a husband and wives need either consent or a fault. But the question is what consider a fault? The same behavior that in the case of the, husband, of the wife would consider a, a, a fault, like ad, adultery. Adultery is a, a, is a classical case in which if the wife was, were not loyal to her, to her husband, then this, is, a, this will enable the husband, the husband to get divorced from her. But what in the opposite situation? What happened if the husband committed adultery, then Jewish law be begin with a lot of 
distinction. Was it in one time or many times? Was it with one woman or many women? But in the other case of the wife, there is no distinction. One shot, then you are getting divorced. So there is no real equality because the same behavior here considered to be fault and in the other case not considered to be fault. The second reason why the Rabbeinu Gershom didn't achieve the equality was uh, because there is other alternative for men but not to, to women. For example, if husband, if the wife refused to get divorced, then husband in, in some circumstances can have permission to get married to a second wife. But what in the other case? What happens if the uh, wife fails to get the consent of the husband for divorce? She doesn't have any other uh, 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 alternatives. And the third pro uh, problem, why there is no real equality is, what happens if you just rebel in the whole system and say, I don't need you to get, I don't need the bill of divorce. If husband is doing it and just make another spousal relationship with another wife, and he has a children, according to Jewish law, this children is not considered to be a bastard, a mamzer, because mamzer in Jewish law is not equal to illegitimate children. Illegitimate children is children that was born outside marriage. In Jewish law, mamzer is the one which was uh, born to married women outside marriage. So if the husband has children outside marriage, it doesn't consider to be bastard. So the husband can tweet on the wife and say, I don't need the bill of divorce. I can handle without it. If you want the divorce, you must cooperate with my divorce settlement because you need it. Because if you will have another relationship, your children will be considered a mamzer. So Rabbeinu Gershom uh, move didn't achieve the equality. So what about the other alternative? The other alternative was, as the husband is able uh, to get divorced according to the Talmudic law whenever he wants, so let's allow the wife to do the same. And as we are going to see, the same thing happened within Jewish law. In, in the Geonim period, which is uh, 1000 uh, PC, there was a new law, a new rule, that enabled a wife to require you, no fault unilateral divorce if she says that she is not able to live with her husband. What is interesting about this move, that at least originally, it was not a liberal or a feminist move, but more a practical move. In this period, there was a, 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 there was a risk that women that will not, go, a, will not get the bill of divorce within Jewish law jurisdiction just will go to the Muslimic a, a jurisdiction, and then uh, the, the aim of the rule was to keep the autonomy of Jewish law. However, the Maimonidist took it as a liberal feminist move and say that this is a moral principle that you cannot for, that you are not going to force a woman to live with somehow one that they hate. And there was about 400 years in which the, the Geonim rule and Maimonides that enable both, that enable the wife to unilateral no fall divorce was the dominant rule. Unfortunately, this move also failed. Why does it fail? One move was about authority. They say, look, the, the Talmudic law is not en enabled it and we doesn't have authority to do it. And it is so similar to things that we are hearing today when we are coming to rabbis or Jewish leaders today and say, look, what will be about equality? What about human rights? They say, you're right, but what can we do? We don't have the authority. The second reason to the fall of the move toward equality was a, a semi-symmetric uh, 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 argument. And this argument was like this. Look, our original position was that, that Husband are subjugated to unilateral no fall divorce. Women are subjugated to fall divorce. But now, after the Rabbeinu Gershom move, the husband are not allowed to get divorced their wife without a reason. So if we are going to continue with Rabbeinu Gershom on one end, but on the other end, to enable the wife to, to, 
to, uh, to require no, unilateral no fault divorce, this means that the wife will be in a better position than the husband. How can it be? As Rabbeinu Asher say in one of his uh, responses, Rabbeinu Gershom means that there will be equality, but he never thinks that the wife should be in a better position than husband. But the third reason is a more interesting one. The third reason say it is something about stability and hierarchy. For example, Rabbeinu Tam say in one of his answers, look, the reason for the original rule was because wife once was modest. So if we want to help them, it will not be a real danger to our society. But today, Nashim are so chutzpaniot. Chutzpaniot is a, how would you translate chutzpaniot? Audacious. And if you, ju if, you, if you just allow them to make unilateral no soul divorce, all our stability, all our system is going to fall. Okay, so I am a little bit sorry so, for talking so, so long, but what I try to do from this and, and example, I try to see, to demonstrate a complex game between equality and religion, which is a very complex. On one hand, we see that the original position is unequal. On the other hand, we see within religious itself, not as external uh, force, but within uh, religious itself, forces that move toward equality. On the other hand, we saw also a counter reaction. And I think this can be kind of a opening to this wonderful conference that really Chaim organized and that all of you that are so prestigious in your field bring to the table example to this so complex and interesting and important interaction between law and religion, between uh, universal values and particular values, between, between tradition and modernity. And I am really happy that Bar Ilan University and especially Faculty of Law, which beside all of our uh, regular universal mission as a mission of uh, struggling with the definition of Israel as a Jewish a democratic state with all of this uh, uh, complexity of this duality. And that's why <coughs> when uh, uh, Professor Yafa Zilberschatz, now the deputy president, but originally the dean of the faculty, and she was responsible for this program, to take a program, which tried to say, we in Barilan, which committed both to Judaism and democracy, try to put both in research and in public activity and in education, uh, these topics on the table. So uh, I invite now uh, Professor Zilberschatz to, to make a greeting, and I welcome you all for coming. Thank you very much, Professor Lifshitz. Shachar, with your permission, if we can switch to um, feeling home. Uh, actually, you know, our Supreme Court uh, former President Barak, he used to say that the uh, Israeli constitutional law exists of uh, the two heads doctrine, which means that our parliament is both a parliament and both a constituent assembly to write the constitution. In a certain way, when I came here, I felt that I'm also, uh, I have a dual uh, had said doctrine on one hand, I'm part of this, as Shachar said, very much involved in anything that has to do with the topic being also a constitutional law um, a teacher and, and writer and scholar, whatever. Uh, but on the other way around, I also have my head as the administration of the university. And since we have so much uh, quality in all the content that is going to be told over here, I will take my second hand head and I will just say a few words about the university because to welcome you all as guests, maybe some of you are first time here, other than the other. So actually, uh, Barilan University was inaugurating uh, this um, now, uh, these days, or is inaugurating uh, these days, its 60th anniversary. The university was founded in 1955, and it was founded by American Jews, uh, which in my eyes, the more I get to it, had a very far-reaching vision about what has to be done here in Israel. Um, we know the Jews originally uh, were in Eastern Europe and they were starting to emigrate to the United States in heavy masses and loads before they even uh, came to uh, Israel. 
and uh, coming to the West from the East, they really confronted um, modernism and they were really the first to confront how do you live in a modern world with religious Jewish values? And that's why the United States really <coughs> had the biggest scholars and thinkers about everything that they had to do, Rabbi Soloveitchik and other big rabbis and philosophers that actually took the lead on the matter. So these kind of Jews believed, they saw that the movement to Israel and the Zionistic movement to Israel and the Israeli universities are very secular. And they are really want to create a new Israeli culture over here, not necessarily based on the Jewish culture. And that's why they invested their own money and really raised a lot of money from American Jews, Orthodox Jews, to build this place. Then, quite fast, the <coughs> state on political reason joined and really made this university a state university, but the origin was really private by American Jewry. Now, what happened by the university growing and growing, uh, there was really a belief which I believe, I thought, which was very right, that the university, uh, no, let's say something else. So the university really started to function as a Jewish university and lots of humanistic uh, studies in the Jewish field, in all the Jewish field, which is literature and Talmud and the Bible and anything and philosophy, really were the core in the sense of this place in its origin. But then I would say in the last 20 or 25 years, the university understood that if they want to be also <coughs> university, universal, it has to really strengthen the exact sciences. And that's how the university in the last 20 years really put a lot of efforts in the exact sciences, having a very big brain center, nanotechnology center, engineering school, medical school recently, etc., etc. After doing all of that, you wake up in the morning and you say, fine, you reach that goal, you are very regular, very big, the university was growing. Okay, you wake up in the morning, where are you heading? And then really came the cry of very serious people in this place saying, okay, we're going really to promote everything, but still we have to go back to the very core ideas and the sense of this very special place being a Jewish university in the sense that it commits so much uh, energy and money and, and anything that has to do with Judaism. So in that sense, let really be the most influential in the field. And that's why people like Shachar, who come with a big project on Jewish and democratic, or on state and religion issue and everything, they really have a way or have a position, not only within this faculty, which naturally will probably bump into this topic, but also within the very large range of the university. So you are now here. I just wanted to make you a little glimpse and acquaintance of this place. And I wanted to tell you by this that you will be confronting whoever you will be confronting, meeting each other, coming from all parts of the world. <coughs> so Chaim, it's wonderful, and Shachar, and everybody, it's in Sylvie, for making all of this happen. It's a really a seminaklai, like we say, it's extraordinary. Mm -hmm. But you should know that this place, it's just we gave you a glimpse <coughs> into all the richness in Jewish culture and tradition that exists over here. And look at this, and really, it should really create a lot of collaborations with the faculty and the rest of the university. I thank, um, I thank you very much for joining us and really finding the time, Judge Handel, to come, and all the guests, Suzanne, that I know, and the others that I don't know. Uh, it's wonderful to see all the faces on the table that was bought when I was dean. So whenever I'm here, I feel so good. I say, well, not too bad. Well, <laughs> I think the chairs were a little bit uh, less quality, good deal, but the table is good. <laughs> so uh, I'm very happy really to host you here. Welcome to bar -Ilan University and enjoy the conference. Thank you very much. Thank you, Yafa. Um, I thought, you know, at the opening of the conference, I'd like to uh, restate uh, our objectives in initiating this conference and uh, present the problems that we, uh, we intended the conference to address. So uh, the conference aims to explore the interrelations between religion and equality. That's the title, right? <laughs> so uh, fundamentally, equality goes, and sometimes we forget that. Fundamentally, equality goes hand in hand with uh, freedom of religion. 
since the principle of equality uh, um, requires the state to treat its citizen equally, which means uh, regardless or not discriminated against them on backgrounds such as uh, race, gender, or religious affiliation. So in this sense, uh, equality support freedom of religion. Uh, you know that some uh, scholars maintain that freedom of religion is ultimately based on equality or equal liberty, and uh, freedom of religion does not grant religion any extra privilege than uh, other uh, um, thoughts or philosophies. But even if we don't accept this specific approach, it seems that equality supports freedom of religion. However, on the other hand, it is clear that there is a tension between uh, equality and freedom of religion. Since uh, liberal democracy has a certain conception of equality, and it imposes this conception on its citizen through various rules and through uh, judicial decisions. Some religious traditions understand equality differently or ascribe to it different way. So we know that Catholics would not appoint women as priests, and Orthodox Jews would not appoint them as rabbis, and Muslim would not appoint them as imams, and we know that some religious, uh, some religions uh, provide separate education to boys and girls, and some, in some cases, even it is not only separate but not equal. And. Uh, okay. <laughs> and. Uh, so, and if you ask these people that belong to these religions, they'll tell you that men and women are equal, of course, but in uh, some places they should be treated differently, like in positions, rituals, and others. After all, also state law sometimes treat men and women differently. However, these areas fall under anti-discrimination laws. And according to anti-discrimination law in uh, liberal uh, democracies, um, discrimination in areas of employment and education is banned. So um, here we have, we have uh, a tension or a contradiction between freedom of religion and equality. And uh, the conflict here is not simple and raises many questions. In what areas should equality prevail and what areas uh, should freedom of religion prevail? So this is one tension that we, we, we thought to address. Note that we intentionally did not phrase the title of the conference freedom of religion and equality, but religion and equality. And that because we're interested not only in the relations between liberal values, but also between equality and religion as such. Namely, the internal perspective of equality, internal religious perspective uh, towards equality. So, uh, and the, in, in, this, in this context, one relevant and significant uh, 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 objective is to look into the various religious traditions and look how do they see the principle of equality. And this is important first to understand our own terms of equality, which uh, historically evolved or developed from these uh, religious traditions. And on the other hand, compare our own terms to um, alternative uh, conceptions of, of equality. So um, we, we expect that the presentations that we'll hear during the conference and the discussion that will follow them, uh, will address these topics and, and uh, I hope all of us will, will uh, learn from them. We have an intense conference. We have about 17 presentations in two and a half days, which is quite intense. But I'm confident that all of them will be fascinating and it won't be too difficult 
to, to go through. And um, I wish all of us, of course, a stimulating and fruitful uh, discussions. Please pay attention to the, um, to the program, which is a bit, uh, there was some changes. You have the updated program in front of you. And you look into it now, it's updated. And tomorrow we, uh, no, tomorrow we have a full day from 9 to 6. And Thursday, we have uh, a bit shorter day from 9 to 4 o'clock. We'll finish by 4 Thursday, not by 6, as we planned at the beginning. We had the uh, one cancellation. So uh, you have the updated program in, in front of you. OK. So, so now I'd like to go to, the, to our keynote speaker and, and a bit, um, you know, introduction. A specific aspect of the, the problem arises in countries that establish religion in one way or another, either as a one state religion or as several, several uh, uh, state religions that the state recognized equally. And, you know, uh, for our American friends, uh, establishment of religion is unconstitutional. But for the other countries, indeed most of the world, it is constitutional. And Israel is such a state that there is kind of establishment of religion. Actually, it is not clear exactly in what way. It is not clear whether in Israel it, we have a state religion or state religions. It might be, uh, it might sound strange to those who come from abroad because it is a Jewish state. It says Jewish state in its declaration of independence and its basic laws. However, the term Jewish in this documents was originated in the UN resolution and meant to state the national character of Israel. Jewish in this uh, formulation meant to be the state of the Jewish people. Not necessarily the Jewish religion. It didn't meant to grant the Judaism as a religion a special status. So it is not clear. One may assert that on the constitutional level, the Judaism or the Jewish religion, religion does not have any special status in the state of Israel. However, on the other hand, of course, there is a special linkage with regard to Judaism between nationality and religion. And it's not, it is not easy to separate these two concepts. So the term Jewish at least bears some or also a meaning of religion. So one can assert that still the Jewish religion has a special status. And this is something which is not, as I said, that said explicitly in our um, constitutional documents. So, in any way, this situation invites a discussion on uh, the relations between uh, nationality, religion, and law.